So we're going to take the next few minutes just to kind of discuss and, and dive deeper into the landscape of myopic as well as presbyopia correction. And amongst our panel includes our four surgeons. And also uh, we have doc doctor. Thank you. You should be. <laughs> I <laughs> Notice how he jumped right in. He's been itching to speak. So for, for that, I'm going to start with Jim Mazo, who is the global president of ophthalmics with Zeiss. And, you know, really, you have the platform that treats corneal refractive surgery uh, that is available today. Uh, there's a great platform with Smile. Um, can you tell us, I mean, we know that refractive laser surgery in the U.S. has been a little bit stunted post-recession. It really hasn't picked up quite as much. How are we doing OUS? Can you, can you give us a little insight there? Well, thanks, Liz, and it is an honor to be with all these great physicians and me uh, on this panel. Um, I, I would tell you that it's very interesting what's happening in the dynamics in the U.S., and it's interesting that today mm -hmm. we didn't have anybody talk about SMILE or, or LASIK procedure, which, which is a concern because that is a modality still to treat patients. It still is only 12 percent of affected audience. Uh, that could have a smile or a refractive lens procedure doesn't have one. And I, I think we're missing an audience there. But why is it more accepted outside the U.S. than in the U.S.? And I just came back from a, a tremendous trip in Korea, and I would tell you that the way they talk to the patient is far better than what we're doing here in the United States. They're engaging the patient. But very interesting enough, they're identifying the patient very early, and then following that patient. And I think the data capture outside the U.S. is far better than what we're doing here. And we'll talk more about myopia and data capture there. But what I believe we're missing here in the United States is the ability to capture the data and then follow that patient along their journey. And they're being much more proactive outside the United States using the data that we have and then calling that patient back in and telling them they have a procedure, not just slay, sick, or smile, but also the procedures you saw today. Yep. And so I would say he who owns the data will win, and he who uses the data or she uses the data will win even better. Gotcha. So we saw that the prevalence of myopia, it's, I was shocked to see that it's upward of 90% yes. of adolescents and the population in China. So are, is, is refractive surgery the, the highest growing in China for that exact reason? Or where are you seeing the greatest amount of growth right now? How many procedures are being done? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that I actually just spent a week in China because of this whole situation. We at Zeiss are doing a study with the government on myopia. And they first have identified it as a disease. And they also, you, one other thing you didn't put on, they've identified that the starch in the diet is also an issue with regards to myopia as well. So it's, it's the diet, it's the lack of sunlight, and it's the mediums of, you know, playing with the Game Boys, et cetera, of the world. So we are doing a study with the government that says at the age of five, and in fact, Liz, you were talking to me about this several, uh, I think, months ago. Age of five, you can identify that if a patient is a plus one, they're going to have a greater incidence of myopia. And what's happening in Asia, if they identify that patient, they're going to have a greater chance for retinal detachment and other issues as well. So what they're doing now is that they're educating the schools to identify that patient early, and as I talked about, with the data. Now, you asked me another question about refractive procedures. It really is the sheer number. Uh, I will just have to tell you, it's the sheer number that outweighs why the U.S. is not as high, yeah. because the amount of myopes and the sheer number of patients, but on an actual percentage, it is still the same medium, except where they're actually gathering the patient data. But I just want to leave with myopia and let the rest of the, the physicians, who are far better than I, uh, we need to get ahead of this issue because I believe that this is going to be a major problem of managing that patient when they get to 40 or 45. And Asia has identified that. I think we're lacking it here in the United States of identifying that this is a disease. This isn't just a condition. Gotcha. 
thank you. So speaking of kind of the control of myopia, um, I was, you know, it's been growing on me, the use of low dose atropine to kind of take care of our patients. And should we be considering it in patients who are younger, who maybe um, are less hyperopic than they should be at a school adolescent age, even if it's coming from a compounded pharmacy until it becomes commercialized? You know, what are your thoughts, Bill, John, Raj? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a great idea. It's, it's seemingly, you know, that, that those young patients are hard to get into the practice if they're not symptomatic. Um, it's, it, I think we're missing them a little bit, and uh, it almost would take a whole process. You'd have to have, like, like the school vision screening things that they do. You'd have to add this, you know, a whole other layer to that. So I think it's more of a systematic approach. I, I don't know if eye doctors are going to be a, a key piece of that. I think it's going to be beyond us, maybe. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, I don't know where that actually starts. If it starts within the ophthalmologist's office when we're only doing maybe 10 to 20 percent of the actual comprehensive examinations. Any other thoughts? Actually, recently we had opportunity to uh, follow up um, to measure um, progressive myopic kits by, us by using uh, objectively visual behavior device, you know, VVR. And we found 50 uh, myopic progressive kits. Mm -hmm. We used VBR. This is, of course, published before, but we understand better. Uh, we, our results was uh, myopic progressive myopic kits has really near vision around 70% of them, 30 centimeter near vision than when we compare others. And also they were always inside, not outside. Uh, also, we can measure illuminance of their lifestyle. They are inside, they are looking very near. It was our results and very parallel to other published results. So uh, I think also we can do some uh, preventive, some education uh, to stop progression of myopia. You're absolutely right. I think that I should become a runner on a keto diet to make sure that I can prevent myopic progression. <laughs> but um, you know, speaking of that, we're talking about refractive surgery and the, per the perceptions thereof. You know, That's a really big jump, Dr. Rajpal, for a vidro to take. Kind of, th that's big to go from the management of ectasia and to say, well, can we actually use this for refractive surgery? I mean, do, what kind of market research, I mean, what are the perceptions that you've seen um, that you've done through Ovidra with regards to this? So I think it's really related to the science of cross-linking. You know, we know that we can strengthen the cornea and we can reshape the cornea in keratoconus patients or in patients who develop ectasia from prior refractive surgery. Um, so if you think of a normal cornea and if you can change the shape, it's a patient base that is not necessarily interested in LASIK if they want something less invasive. So some of the market research that you've asked about that we've looked at is related to why do patients not choose to have refractive surgery. Mm -hmm. And often the most common reason is fear. Um, certainly there are others, cost, et cetera. But Pixel can play a role in those patients that may not be LASIK or PRK candidates or that may have a low enough correction that they can have a small amount of effect by cross-linking, mm -hmm. or a reasonable effect that they need to achieve, and they view it as drops and light. And it's not something that they look at as a dangerous procedure. And that's why I think, especially when we look at presbyopic patients, say somebody in their mid to late 40s, perhaps in a few years they'll be trying the presbyopic drops. They like it, but they don't want to keep using it on a regular basis, or they don't want to have the ongoing cost of it, or maybe it does cause a little irritation, then they may be perfect candidates for Pixel if it works the way we um, have seen in preliminary data that it can induce that small amount of change, both myopic or hyperopic, depending on what the patient needs. Um, and I know that in your presentation, you actually discussed that you'll be engaging in phase two studies. Um, where are you now? I mean, where has Pixel gone in the last year? How much progress has been made? So it's been over this last year and even prior to that uh, work done to evaluate those 200 some patients that have been treated, looking at various treatment parameters, looking at treatment algorithms, and getting all of the information we need to be able to conduct that multi-center trial. Great, thank you. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, we have Bill Wiley, who's almost a presbyope, right? 29, 30? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're doing plenty of stuff yeah. as it relates to synthetic and Lays, you know? So I'm putting you in the hot seat. Yeah. You're gonna need something. Is it gonna be Pixel? 
I mean, what would you do if you were going to get a presbyopia correcting treatment right. option? Yes, yeah, so I've thought a lot about that. So, um, I am uh, post RK. I think I'm like the you know youngest RK patient you know alive right now or something like that. My dad did it when I was uh, right out of college, and so that sort of limits. Uh, yeah, so I'm post RK. So so that kind of limits what my options are. So I'm looking at these you know uh, technologies that come out, and what what would a post RK patient choose for their eyes? And uh, a couple of things that come to mind if I need if I need lens surgery, I am thinking about the light adjustable lens. I think that could sort of certainly give me the distance vision that I, that I will need, but uh, I also think of the aperture optic. I think um, you know multifocal or trifocal or extended depth of focus is just not going to you know deliver for my eyes what, what I would need. I'd probably add to my glare halo if I have it now. Um, and so an aperture optic with a um, you know on a on a IOL would give me that distance, intermediate, and near vision, and uh, probably take my vision from where I am now and step it forward and opposed to RKI. So uh, I think that um, most of the presbyopic lenses that we see now sort of add to aberrations or add to glare. This is the one that sort of takes those things away and uh, puts us, you know, it's, I think it's going to be great for eyes that are slightly irregular or have some, you know, other pathology. Gotcha. So you would think right now, given you've already had RK surgery, that yeah. you'd, you'd go for a lens-based approach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I might gateway with it with uh, pharmacologic uh, drops and, and, and buy time, okay. I suppose. Yeah. Well, the drops keeps you on stage. Yeah. I was about to kick you. <laughs> with yeah. regards to different presbyopia yeah. correcting options, and I know with Allotech, we're using allogenic tissue. Yeah. Um, when I think of allogenic tissue, I think of epicardophagia, and I think of the, the tribulations and hurdles there. Can you tell me in comparison to the synthetic inlays, clarity results, I mean, your gestalt there, what is your experience been like? Yeah. Uh, my longest following patient is uh, more than one year recently. And uh, I, I observe every day going better, remodeling of cornea, because this is natural tissue. This is natural human tissue. And uh, there is no haze, no allergic reaction. Um, so uh, when I compare synthetic, uh, synthetic inlays, uh, of course, there is not too much haze, not too much allergy, but we didn't see any patient vision loss because of this reason. So it was really, I'm happy to perform when I recommend patients this surgery because uh, it is, of course, inlay is advantages, all inlays, reversible, exchangeable, but also I know there is not very permanent, uh, safety is really important, yeah. And the allogenic inlay is specifically for presbyopia correction only? Uh, also, uh, we use for hyperopic co correction. Uh, hyperopic uh, monovision also, if hyperopic presbyopic cases, hyperopic young cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, after LASIK surgery, uh, we can, there is regression after 10 years or little more. Uh, we can elevate flap, ready flap, and we can put hyperopic lenticule, and this is also alternative option. For sure. Treatment. So for every cornea, one human cornea, how many of these lenticles can actually be created? Around 60 lenticles. It is very good wow. because we, Allotex doesn't use one lenticle from one cornea. So this is really very effective. Also, all corneas are not suitable suitable for corneal transplantation, maybe less endothelial cell count. And for this reason, to use corneas uh, to correct presbyopia is very good uh, option. Gotcha. Thank you so much. And certainly, again, Dr. Vukic, I want to go into refractive indexing. I think that this is um, truly one of the more disruptive uh, forms uh, of surgery that we're going to be experiencing, both from a lens standpoint as well as a corneal standpoint. Um, talk about hysteresis. Talk about what, what have you seen, or do we have any data with what happens when the femtosecond laser touches the cornea like that? The, it's early in the development, clearly. There's been a proof of concept in first in human trials that have been conducted for presbyopia treatments. And so it is moving through the pipeline. And so there's already, as with all technology, a next generation in terms of smaller, faster uh, lasers and the sort of things that would allow more complex treatments or, or the sort of things that we would want to use on a commercial basis. Um, you talk about hysteresis. It causes densification of the cornea. It does not remove tissue. If anything, it actually makes the 
cornea uh, a little bit stiffer. So there is that uh, potential safety uh, issue. Uh, as far as corneal sensation, as far as preserving the corneal nerves, that was an unexpected finding, quite frankly. We didn't anticipate that, but very welcome finding now. And the histology on that was just, just demonstrated at Arbo just a few days ago, so we can talk about that now. So it's minimally invasive tissue sparing, or not even tissue sparing, it doesn't remove any tissue. So I think it's going to have a place. And again, um, as I would mentioned, the contact lens use is going to be the first application that we'll all have the ability to prescribe our patients and use. That is on the near horizon. Uh, the human trials, uh, those are in process now. We're planning additional trials. And um, again, more on this to come, but I think, it's, I think we need to pay attention to it. It looks like it's going to be a real thing. Can I just make one comment? You know, it's interesting, the last group that, that uh, Sam did a great presentation in the group before in this group, the one thing that's concerning me is that more patients, less doctors. And what's great about all the technologies is, is the options, but what we're missing is the diagnosis. And I think we need to make sure we're spending the proper time on diagnosing the patient because you don't have enough time anymore. You just don't have enough tough time to guess what's the right. So I think we need to also start spending time and energy around the proper diagnosis. And, and also you saw you know, with the Avellino, with the diagnostic tests, with the, with the genetic testing, we have to do a better job of diagnosing because we have to eliminate the guess. Yeah. You don't have time anymore. There are just too many patients for the amount of physicians. So I, I think the other thing we need to do is to take advantage of these technologies is proper diagnosis. True. And, you know, with that, so there's a huge delta, as you mentioned, between how many are actually getting eczema laser surgery versus how many are discontinuing contact lenses and how many actual myopes actually exist. Part of that is the negative noise that surrounds laser surgery, you know. So what can we do as a panel? I mean, any ideas, suggestions, so we can increase the positive noise um, as it relates to a, a, a transformational and a very positive procedure within our field? Well, I, I will tell you again, just coming back from Korea and seeing, I, I personally believe if you haven't had a chance to go to Korea, go to Korea because I think they have done the fab, most fabulous job of talking about non-reimbursed products to the consumer. I, I, it's unbelievable how positive. I wish ophthalmology replicated uh, aesthetic dermatologist. Nobody talks price. We talk outcomes. And, and I think the more what we have seen here, all these part of outcomes, that's what we should be talking about. Price should not play into the factor. Your, these are our eyes. If we diagnose and treat, price doesn't play because you're making them more productive. And I, and I think sometimes we're so insular in this industry of attacking new technology, we should be more proactive and support every one of the technologies that have been described at this OIS because they're all trying to advocate better outcomes. Price should not be in the play, but we do it to ourselves all the time. And industry is also to blame as well. But I would talk about being advocates for the technology, not talking negative about the technology. Sure. I would second your first comment, which was everyone should go to Korea. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but beyond that, when you talk about price, and this is something, do you, do you mean us discussing price with the patients, or do you mean the price as in cost to entry? Yes. Yeah. You talk, you, I mean, how many times do you hear that the, when you talk to your technicians in the office, the first thing they're doing is talking to the patient is what's the price of the technology? And, and not the benefits of the technology. We do it to ourselves. We are so insular in our thought process. We've got to stop doing that. So John, I'm going to start with you and end the se session with what pearl could you provide to everyone out here, clinicians and industry alike? Um, that was a great one. Let's not talk price. Let's not um, be our own worst enemy when it comes to taking care of our patients. What would you say in this realm of the holy grail in ophthalmology, um, cash-based services like such as this? I think the key is to start the education process early. You don't want a patient to arrive and not be aware of what the options are and start that conversation during the exam. They need to be prepared with either printed information or email if it's a younger patient or whatever. They need to be aware of what their options are so they come in with questions as opposed to thinking, I can't make a decision. And so that is very effective, but quite frankly, as, as a group and as clinicians, we're not really good at that in our profession, but we can get better. 
Aileen, what would you offer? You do so much in terms of um, you were first innovatively with Smile and now with Allotech. What do you? What? What would you offer as advice? Uh, I offer actually uh, we. Even our staff, we don't know how much we need near vision. We should inform patients first how much they need near vision in their life. Mm -hmm. And uh, this education should be maybe face-to-face, -face, uh, maybe other way, whatever. So this is not today our topic, but they should be very aware how much they need near vision in their life, how much their life will change, how much quality will change. If they aware about that, uh, they would be very different way to accept surgery. Sure, thank you. Dr. Raj Paul? So certainly all great comments and I would agree. I would add that I think patients come in often having researched what they think they want, you know, to John's comment that we should do a better job of educating them. But I think after that, we should also do a better job of narrowing the options for what we think is right. So we should listen to the patients and then guide them towards, for example, again, using presbyopia, since that's what we're talking about, this is what I think is right for you at this stage of your presbyopia. This is what you're gonna need next. Because otherwise, I think we've seen in refractive cataract surgery, if you tell a patient you can have a multifocal lens, you can have an accommodative lens, you can have a toric lens, you can have femtosecond surgery, they don't know what to choose. So we have to help them understand and then suggest something. Yeah, I was going to say, I, almost exactly just layering on on that. We, we, you know, as much as we come back from these meetings, we've talked about technology all day, and it's on our mind. But when I'm facing forward with patients, I don't bring up technology at, at all. I just say, how do you want to see? Do you want to see great distance? Do you want to see great near? Do you want to see both? And then if they say yes, 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 I say, okay, I'll choose the technology that's going to be best for you. I think we get so caught up in multifocal aura, you know, femto, laser, whatever, all these things, and the patients just get you know, sort of cloud over. We just have to focus on what are they looking for? They're looking for an outcome, and we just have to be confident we're going to deliver it to, uh, to them. All right, so there you have it. Between education and the growing number of options, I hope that that the same panel in 10 years, as we discussed earlier, will have a very different face of you know, what we are doing to help our patients. Thank you very much.